I did not think about you. I did not care about you. You're not important to me. And that's where we're at today. Yes. How does that make you feel, Deech? I feel nothing. Hello, my friends. Thank you for joining us for the PebCAC Podcast, a weekly information security show featuring some all-around good people. It is week 30 of 2024. I'm Chris Lurie, and back with a tan from sunny San Diego. With me, I have my co-host, the Cloud God, who already needs some Rogaine and a spray tan. Okay. <laughs> You're right, I do. Good to be back, guys. No quippy comment or comeback on that one, Brian. I know. Not today. <laughs> he, he, he insulted us plenty before we started recording, so I think he already got it out of his system. I, well, I can't do Rogaine because I've zapped the hair off my head with laser. So it's a great, great... Great call out, uh, Chris, but yeah, it doesn't make any sense. <laughs> but you do have that one that's just sticking up. I don't know where they do this. The, the Charlie Brown hair. He, he curls that. It's, it's used it's for my... Is that the comb over? My Clark Kent. I don't have my glasses on. Yeah. Ah. And we have Glenn Medina, or should we call him Companion Pass Glenn, or CPG. Glad you could fit us in between your travels with your wife. Isn't it nice that you can get, uh, uh, you can make a a, a, a a tier in travel and you can bring your wife along for basically uh, six bucks for each leg. It's not bad. I, I, I got to give it to Southwest, give them props on how easy it is to uh, to be able to travel and add a person for, for not much. Our guest this week is Rick Grimes. I mean, Ben Coral. Ben just got back from seeing the new Twisters movie, so he will have a unique perspective on both cybersecurity and anomalous weather patterns. Welcome back, Glenn. <laughs> Happy Glenn, to be here. Ben. <laughs> All good. Glenn, it's Ben. Welcome back, Ben. I'll play there the tape go. and I'll make sure you didn't correct me incorrectly. Oh, wow. Ben. That's how All this right. is going to start today. <laughs> Welcome, Ben. Oh, Rick. <laughs> <laughs> Call me whatever you want. Combined, we have decades of information security experience in here, not just to educate, but to entertain. We've got at least two awesome stories for this week, so sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. This week, we're going to talk about an update to a story we covered last week. The recent CrowdStrike debacle, and if we have time, we'll talk about what Fin7 and Southwest are up to. For our first topic, since our last episode, as predicted, more news about how the FBI broke into the phone of President Trump's would-be assassin. Last week when we reported, we said we had no idea what kind of phone it was, but through recent reporting, we found out the phone owned by the shooter was a late model Samsung Android phone, according to 9to5Mac. Last week when I gave the FBI credit that they can break into these things in-house now, Looks like they might have overstated their abilities. It turns out the FBI owns a subscription to the Celebrite device. The company most famously was thought to be the one that unlocked the iPhone belonging to one of the terrorists of the 2015 terrorist attack in San Bernardino, but it actually turned out to be a different company. The device the FBI owned could not unlock the late model Samsung phone, so they contacted the company Celebrite and Obviously, they wanted to help out, so they sent the FBI some experimental software, which eventually allowed them to break into Thomas Crook's phone and learn absolutely nothing new. At least that is what they are telling us. So you're saying you don't believe them? That that they're not being forthcoming? (laughs) That they're not being honest? Really? Uh, The U.S. intelligence agency not being honest with the public? That would be a first, wouldn't it? It's for the better of the, uh, the people. For the... From a social aspect, right? It's we can't handle the truth. That's why <laughs> we have that. Protecting us from ourselves. Fair enough. Got it. That's right. That's right. Well, at least we know now it wasn't an iPhone. He, the would-be assassin was an Android user. And that's how they probably broke into the phone so fast, since it was Android. You think they needed this? So what you're saying is they needed the Celebrite service in order to break into it. Or a Celebrate device? Yeah, it's a hardware device. They plug the phone in, and then 
that hardware runs special software and that software has all the exploits, all the zero days, all the unlocking methods. To and, it. Since it, and since it was a late model phone, it probably wasn't updated, didn't have all the, the lock features turned on that you would normally think on a, on a more modern phone. Pretty much, yeah. They they basically had to like jailbreak the celebrate device to run experimental software, and they said, "Well, we've got these zero days that might work. They're not GA yet, but why don't you give it a try?" What what do you, what do you think they were planning to get from that? Just like maybe accomplices, maybe some history. I mean, they they already knew history of, of the person already, right? I mean, had the family and everything else. Probably like a manifesto, or I think they're more interested in text messages. Like, was he plotting? Was this really a lone gunman type attack or was it a larger conspiracy you're saying maybe he was weaponized by some organization that, that, that's <laughs> radicalized really where I was if going. he would yeah that, that, not just the accomplices but was he just the you know the the weapon was he just the trigger man you know pun intended or you know, was there a bigger deal going on is there more to you know paul harvey you know the rest of the story that's really where, where I thought that there might be a reason for it. Maybe they can go check Hillary Clinton's web server. I mean, uh, email servers, and they'll find a link inside there. Yeah, 30,000 missing emails now. <laughs> 30,001. 30, and one. Yeah. <laughs> I wonder if they found, like, Signal on there, and they had, like, disappearing messages. Like, who are these contacts that he's contacting through Signal? There's no chat history here. But I don't know that this guy was that good on on opsec or not yeah still no history on ulterior mode on his motives or anything like that right i mean it's just all conspiracy right now yeah i would say not not according to the official report there's really nothing that they learned from this or any kind of motive they i think the more most recent headline i saw was that uh, the the would-be shooter crooks was researching google searching like uh what distance did you know oswald killed jfk he was looking things up like that so it seems like definitely intended to do this but it didn't there's real no real motive or any accomplices that they they found yet so I, so go ahead no I, I was gonna say i i get that you're looking at some of those older things you know with with you know the previous but that was a long time ago technology has changed you, you technology not just for digital but even for you know, the weapons and things like that as well so why, why would you even bother with some of those types of searches? They're seemingly little to, to gain, to learn, to, to do with those as well. But I, I guess you're sitting here and saying maybe there's not a lot of rational thinking that was going on and things weren't always, I guess, logical. Ra yeah, logical... No, rational maybe. I mean, he brought a rangefinder there like an hour before. Like he was, he had like a rangefinder in his eyes. Like, yeah. what legitimate use could you have for a rangefinder and figuring out where the president's gonna stand? Like that should have thrown up so many red flags. And yeah, I'm sure this will come out in the the congressional testimony and everything. And then I think so. You can someone can correct me if I'm wrong, but I I thought I also saw a news report that this guy flew a drone over the area like an hour before to like get the lay of the land using a drone, and that didn't set off any red flags apparently either. I, that's the thing is you know that's where you have these things and i know that there's a a joint of you know what is it that the the federal law enforcement has versus the local law enforcement but you know hours before an event how are you able to fly something in the air above that event that's the thing that really gets me yeah i, I think it's breakdown of security security controls and ultimately, it led to one person, right, who's the director of the CIA, who has yeah. yet to step down. Um, she she did. Director like, of the Secret Service stepped Secret down. Secret Service, yeah. Yeah. Uh, oh, Jimmy she Shiegel. did? Yeah. She finally stepped down. Oh, thank she goodness. Did. Yeah. So, yeah. She was under tremendous pressure from Congress. and Both sides. And, yeah. Yeah, was, both sides. was pretty upset about this. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Understandably. But that's just a lapse in your... Do you think that was politically motivated? I mean... The fact that he did not have his uh, his full entourage and 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 proper protection. I, 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 another conspiracy theory, right? Well, that, I, I we, mean, we just keep going on and on, and we could just spin ourselves. Well, it, but that's the thing; it's all risk. 
And you know, you yeah. can Monday morning quarterback everything. You know, I, I've done enough instant response that I've been questioned so many different times. Ooh, look at that guy coming back. Oh, good timing. But talk about Monday morning quarterbacks and Deach comes back in here. But you know, <laughs> everything comes down to risk assessments. And you know, was there a credible threat? And you know, was there enough to justify increased protection and additional agents being, uh, being allocated? And I don't have access to the information, but I could also sit here and say, I'm sure that there's never enough people, there's never enough budget, there's never enough to go around. So just because somebody asked for it, if you can't show that credible threat, I'm sure that it's very hard to justify allocating additional resources, especially 24 by it's seven. Just, I mean, it's just like cybersecurity. I watched an interview with a secret service guy and this is way before all this happened. And the, how he talks about secret service protection is just exactly like how we talk about security. He says there's layers. There's layers of security. There's a layer of security next to the president. There's layers of security outside. It, it works in rings, and you have to, all these things that have to work together. But the only way you get something to go wrong is that all these rings of protection like fail at the same time, and that seems to be what happened here. The other interesting thing to note is that according to leaked internal documents from Celebrate, if the assassin had been using a late model iPhone or an iPhone running the latest version of iOS, Celebrate would not have the technical capability to break into the phone without the passcode. If you are running at least iOS 17.4, there's no open sesame from Celebrate or the FBI. As a note, iOS 17.5.1 is the latest version, so the majority of users should already be on a non vulnerable version. And a note for our Good friend Victor, most Android phone phones are vulnerable to celebrate devices. The only exceptions are late model Google Pixel phones when they're fully powered off because of the additional cold boot protections. When the phone is simply locked, all bets are off. So when it's on but locked, all bets are off. That's wild. Yeah, for most Android phones. Mm. And it's interesting. Like, so, so, repeat that again? If it's on but locked, all bets are off. You can get access into the device. Yeah, the FBI can can break into almost any Android device. Yeah, but if it's if it's powered off, like if you pull out the battery or you you shut it down completely, there's certain cold boot features that protect against these these vulnerabilities. See that that's why last time I was hanging out with Victor, you know, his his backpack that he carries around, the outside zipper has a ver Faraday. Yeah. You know, Faraday cage on it. <laughs> that blanket. VDL? You're talking about VDL? Absolutely. I, I'm sure he does. Uh, that guy. <laughs> our, 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 our favorite Canadian? Yeah. Our favorite Canadian. Yeah, that, that's, that's his layer of security. Just no signals in or out. Forget somebody <laughs> punching him and stealing his phone. <laughs> and then holding it in front of his face so it unlocks. Yeah. Yeah, or the old rubber hose trick. Just beat somebody with a rubber hose until they cough up the passcode. Oh, uh, pinky toes, man. J just got to smash that pinky toe. <laughs> and, and they're going to tell you what that code is. Yeah. But I don't carry enough secrets to care enough and worry that my pinky toe is going to get smashed. But you can have it all. You, you want have my, it. <laughs> you want my passwords, you can have it. You want so. the island browser source code? Open yeah. Sesame. Here you go. Yeah. <laughs> I'll even tell you what my old passwords were at Zscaler. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but but that's also the other thing of all this data, all these things that are out there, all your passwords have to be, you know, 8 to 12 to 15, you know, characters, uppercase, lowercase, special characters, numeric, and all of this. But to get access to your bank account with your ATM card, to get access to your phone, four digits, Four, four numeric digits and you get access to, to everything. Yeah, I wonder if you can ask a bank to increase the length of your pin. Like you put in your card and instead of a four digit, you, you could ask for a six digit pin. You could do eight. You could do that or if that'd be... Can you uh, do eight? Yeah. I, I, yeah, because Brian does seven, you know, eight, six, seven, five, three, oh, nine. <laughs> Timmy two-tone. <laughs> <laughs> Too, so. Or he can go. Ba he can go based off of his favorite show and just go nine hundred two one zero. 
I, I thought you were about to say 24. <laughs> That'd be a pretty short passcode. All right, for our second topic, I had multiple people ask me to cover this story of the podcast, and I'm guessing this will take up the majority of the rest of the podcast. Uh, basically, more than any other story that has ever been requested, so I feel I owe it to our listeners to talk about it. I like to say whenever I go on vacation, the world burns down, and this was actually no exception. I woke up in a sunny San Diego to a flurry of text messages from coworkers and ex-colleagues with CrowdStrike memes, which meant something really bad went down. In case you were hiding under a rock for the last week, cybersecurity vendor CrowdStrike pushed out an update to their Falcon sensor to detect a kernel-level command and control channel and accidentally sent every Windows endpoint protected by their EDR into a blue screen of death. Now, technically it was a recovery screen, but it was still blue. The machine was completely unusable until somebody physically went to the machine, booted it up in safe mode, and deleted the problematic file. Now, there were some cases where they said if you reboot it three times, it would fix itself, and there's some that says if you reboot it ten times, it would fix itself, and there was some where if you boot it uh, quickly enough before it blue screen, it would get a network connection and download the good file. Those people were, were saved, but companies like Delta Airlines, they were completely knocked offline. Even for a week, they're still handling canceled flights. I, I even got a message from Amazon. I had ordered a bunch of stuff on Prime Day, and I got a message from Amazon saying, your, your delay might be delivery due to a third-party outage. I'm like, hmm, I wonder who that could be. So I got to ask, you guys are in the industry. How many times have you guys been asked, what's your recovery plan should anything like this happen to you guys? And I'm sure we've all gone through this, right, as of late. For some reason, yeah, it went up 5,000% this week. <laughs> I'm not too sure why. <laughs> not only do you have a recovery plan, have you tested it? That's that's really the, the key there. It's just like backups. Yeah, I have backups. When's the last time you tested them? Hmm, oops. I just feel terrible for the seven engineers that had to re restore like 30,000 servers and get them back up and running at one co at one customer. I was like, damn, man, that's, that's going to be a long weekend. And it's all <laughs> one at a time, right? I mean, it sounded like it was just all one at a time. There's there was no, no automated way to do it. There's no remote way to do it. It was one at a time physically going in front of that box. Well, if it was virtualized, you just blow it out and... You know, just re yeah, recover yeah. from a snapshot. Yeah, I think a lot yeah. of people did that. Yeah. And, and if you were able to try the, that three, seven, or ten reboots, some that were trying to use the, the out of band in order to do the reboots to see if that would work. I've heard of some companies who were trying that, which of course found that to be, you know, largely ineffective according to the ones I've chatted yeah. about it. it. So if I remember when I was in operations, this was quite a while ago. There was also an order that you had to bring systems back up, right, in order to get communications and, and, and whatnot working. I'm sure that had a lot to do with their DR plans as well as far as, okay, let's break up the DR plan. Which services do we bring back up first and which ones were affected and which ones are we going to have to reboot again after, you know, after we get things back up and running again? It's always production systems. Production systems first. You know, if, if Chase.com goes down, that's millions of dollars per second that they're down. Or if they, you know, people. This actually affected the stock markets. There are people that couldn't couldn't trade stocks and equities during this time, and that's that's lost money right there. I heard Delta Airlines alone, just one company, that their tally so far just on canceled flights is five hundred million. Just one company. Just, just think about the 8.5 million endpoints that were affected. You know, Dick's Sporting Goods, there's pictures of Dick's Sporting Goods, a big sign on the door, our store's closed due to an IT outage. That's that's loss of revenue for them. Absolutely. You know, and to sit here and all businesses, and I, I know the word all is, is a little strong, but businesses truly are digital businesses. And I believe that this is you know, case in point. This is evidence. The amount of businesses that don't sell services, they don't sell digital goods, they sell widgets. Dick Sporting Goods is a great example here. This really shows us that businesses truly are digital enterprises. Otherwise, they would not have been nearly as impacted as they were last week and this week as well. Yeah, airlines, yeah, airlines, the planes, 
They don't need the internet in order to fly, but they, so many processes focused on the digital assets that they were, you know, they were crippled. So again, most businesses or all businesses really are digital in this day and age. I just remember interviewing at places prior to coming to Zscaler. And I think it was like Illumio and Gardacore. Them talking to me about how awesome their endpoint thing was because it hooks into the kernel. And I was just like, man, this is going to be an awkward time for them as well because <laughs> they didn't have an outage. But their stuff, you know, like that was like one, like I think it was on the second slide, right? It's like we talked about our agent, how it hooks into the kernel. Like, ee, that's not, that's not a good one. I, I think, I don't know if Tetration did that as well. And then I think, eh, I'll leave it at that. But yeah, anyways, that, that it's got to be a rough kind of quarter coming up for the, a lot of these companies. And I did see a lot of knee-jerk reactions from customers where there's like, we're done. Like, it's we're never going back to CrowdStrike. Um, unfortunately, I think that's kind of a, a dumb move. And uh, the flip side of the coin was, well, you know, what, what else could we be doing with you to make us more secure? And like, ah, you know, like. I get it. Like I, you yeah, know, we're having, but it, lots of resiliency audits are going on right now. One of the, no, the no. I was going to say, like, you know, we Zscaler does have an endpoint solution, but it does not hook into the kernel whatsoever. So, uh, you know, from my perception, this wouldn't be a thing that would uh, would happen. But I do remember when I first came aboard Zscaler, I was like, uh, I think it was two weeks in the job, and I was really concerned about this because when I worked at U.S. Airways, uh, a, you know, endpoint thing for servers took out usairways.com. It was ConfigureSoft, which I think eventually was bought by EMC, and then it was actually taken out to the pasture uh, not too long after that because <laughs> it blew, like it, it wiped out our entire server farm on a, on a Labor Day weekend. And so I was on call. I was the guy that my entire weekend, it was only 30 servers, but it took forever to get that thing. So I, when I left or when I, when I had that experience, it was very knee jerk. The you know the guy that was in charge is like, pull it off. We're never using it again. And then I was bitter, you know, like the like you know tiny and bitter, like the the British. Um, and I thought when I came to Zscar, I was like, man, if this endpoint agent sucks, I'm gonna quit and go work for Palo Alto. And uh, I started. <laughs> I, I the, one of the first things I did is when we had uh, we had a different. I think we had a different. I won't mention it by name. We had a different support portal than what we use today. And I was like Google, not Google. I was searching, left, right, up and down, blue screen death, high CPU, battery drain, and I like I really couldn't find anything. And so, the second weekend, I went to an SE summit, and I, I ran into this guy by the name of David Creedy, and I was like, and I found out he was the PM for for Zscar Client Connector, and and I went up to him, I was like, hey man, I know your dirty little secret. You're going in, in the support thing and you're deleting these things, right? You're deleting, you're deleting evidence that this thing sucks. He's like, what the hell are you talking about, dude? I was like, <laughs> and then, then he sat me down. He's really polite. And he's like, you do understand that all the crap that we do that can cause a blue screen death doesn't actually occur on the endpoint. It's, it's done in the cloud. I was like, oh, he goes, it's just a lightweight steering mechanism. I was like, oh, okay. Now it's starting to make more sense why this thing doesn't suck. Uh, so anyways, there, there's my long story short on, uh, on, on this particular topic. I, I don't know if you guys remember of it. Yeah. I don't know if you guys remember, but in 2010, uh, McAfee had this, uh, same issue. Mm -hmm. It was called a, uh, the McAfee dat file 5958 for those of you guys. That Damn. Look at you, dude. Um, yeah. did exactly the same thing. Basically, uh, there was a, a, a file update that happened and it pretty much took out everything that uh that happened at that time that was like burned in his memory he had to live through that recovery so he's always cursing that, well, that i was at four, four number file name i was at a i was getting ready to leave um my uh cur my, my previous employer several employ employments ago and it took them out but uh what's interesting though and i'll, I'll just put this as a fun fact um like i said nothing against uh this person is the cto of uh, McAfee at that time, guess was who? The yep. co-founder and CEO of CrowdStrike. No way. There you go. No way. <laughs> I'll leave it that. I'll leave it at that. Conspiracy <laughs> theories abound. <Yeah. laughs> his, his name's Greg, right? Uh, George. George. Oh, George. Leave George. George alone. Poor guy. 
<laughs> I need to be roasting him on the Pepcac podcast. Crying out loud. All right. Uh, he's all he's right. having a hard enough time as is. We'll leave him alone. Yeah, the, the one word you cannot use to describe him, Brian, is poor. There's nothing about him. <laughs> I, you know, I will say, like, uh, I didn't follow everything that he was posting on, on LinkedIn, but he was pretty pretty transparent. I mean, he, he, he bent the knee, went down owned it and and tried to figure out how to move forward. So I'll give him a lot of credit for that. And and the rub of it is exactly what Brian mentioned is the kernel level access. That's why Macs weren't affected. And that's why Linux was not affected because Mac kicked everything out of the kernel, like the uh, two major releases ago, we were okay because we didn't operate in the kernel, but I know other major vendors out there had a really hard time. I know the AnyConnect client had to move out. The Guardian Edge client had to move out and it was causing all kinds of issues but mac did the right thing kicked everybody out of the kernel but there's always a trade-off and that's that's the thing there's a trade-off between your know, security and visibility it's it's the whole ios model ios is considered by most extremely secure but it's also very black boxy that you can't yep. see into it you don't know what's going on but it's a trust you know us us as apple like trust us we know what we're doing as, as apple but for windows uh there's i, I put a side note here that the EU might be to blame for this because when Microsoft entered the AV market with Windows Defender, Windows Defender runs in the kernel. It has to because that's the best place to monitor processes and things like that. And the EU said, well, if Windows, if Microsoft Defender gets to run in the kernel, so does everybody else. You, that's anti-competitive if you don't let them do that. So now everybody gets kernel level access. It's the giant wild west. Maybe it's kick everybody out, including Microsoft themselves, out of the kernel. And maybe things like this might stop. I said it once, I said it a thousand times. Processes inside the kernel, nasty. It's like users on the network. It's yucky. Keep them, keep them out of there. Simple as that. <laughs> what was the... No, uh, no but... No, it, it all goes back to that 2006, 2007 with the, the new operating system that was coming out then. Uh, the Microsoft operating system. Vista. So Vista was coming out. Yeah. <laughs> oh exactly. man, you are like taking it way back. <laughs> See, but I, I, I'm not taking it back to. Uh, uh, well, I, I guess back there with that McAfee, but I can't tell you, uh, you know, all the different changes, all the different things. But Microsoft was offering or you know, recommending even then, again, kernel level, that WFP, anybody that that Windows filtering platform. And that was going to be, you know, their early on way of giving, giving software access where it could run things without having kernel level mode. But Defender had kernel level access. Therefore, that was also driving some of these things that were coming out of the EU as well of gives you unfair advantage. So, yes, but that all went back to Vista because I remember during that time. Like, what is this operating system? Are we going to start migrating? Is this going to be an enterprise level one? Or what's that going to look like? Oh, come on now. You don't get a choice. It's always going to be an enterprise. Like, it's the next version. You guys have to do it. But this would explain why I was terrified. I think it was around the, the Windows Vista days. when I, did, I remember I came across something called GMER. Do you guys remember that? No. I even know what the acronym stuck, uh, stood for, but it was it was hell bent on finding processes that were running in the kernel, so you couldn't see it when you would open up the task manager. But then you would use it was similar to like rootkit revealer. It's like a rootkit. Yeah. yeah, and so you would do that, and I remember just like crapping my pants. It's like, oh my god, if this is on my computer, like what am I going <laughs> to find on other things? And sure enough, like this is back in the day when I was like doing my own little side hustle, right, and helping people fix computers. And I remember that was like the, the one thing that boot in the safe mode, do that. And it didn't matter what you had. I was cleaning this son of a up so quick. It was great. And seeing of root kits, I remember like back when Sony CDs had the DRM in it, you'd pop the CD in your computer, play music. It would just install a root kit that would basically not allow you to copy the CD. And it's like, what, what gives you a right to put it in this crap where on my computer? So, the kernel's still open, so there, that must be, like, GMER, like a rootkit revealer, must be something that's kind of built into every EDR at this point, right? I think it's got to be. That's the only way to find a rootkit. Yeah. That or something equivalent to that. 
But what if there is logic built in to hide itself from the, the rootkit revealer, right? It's the trace buster, probably... buster, buster. Yeah. That's <laughs> uh, wild. Yeah, it's always got to be a cat and mouse. One of our stories later, I, I'm positive we're not going to have time to go to it, but they're like using Windows sys internals or using Windows own processes against themselves to hide themselves or to kill processes, those living off the land techniques. They're getting pretty sophisticated. That's exactly why we're in this mess is because CrowdStrike pushed an update that looks for kernel level command and control signals. And that's, that's when they ran into problems. Like it was to detect, I think it's Windows pipes was a command and control vector that they were updating their signatures for. I'll tell you what, some people on X did an incredible job of explaining like what actually happened, like the, the null pointer and like what that really meant in space and the reason why it killed itself. And then, which was pretty amazing. I, I was like, all right. And then what, another guy came on top of him and was like, dude, your math is all wrong. You're saying it's at position 45, it's at 44. I'm like, you freaking <laughs> nerds, my God. But, uh, like, but it did dumb Twitter. it down. Yeah, <laughs> like it, it worked, right? And then next thing you know, like it just hard left turn to all the conspiracy theories in the world. And they were great, I mean, which I think is the reason why George came out and was like, this is not a cybersecurity incident. And I was like, you must be dealing with all the, you know, the tinfoil hat people. I choose to believe all the things. So I think the funniest one was I sent it to the two of you, my co-host in the group chat. I'll send it to Ben, too. It was a 4chan post. And, of course, everyone on 4chan is obviously trolling. But it said something like, you know, right before this CrowdStrike outage, there was a big Azure outage. So they said, well... Azure had an outage. Azure was running the Biden AI because because obviously Biden's already dead and it's a it's a we're, uh, weekend at Bernie situation. So the Biden AI went down, and then uh, they had to have this CrowdStrike cover up because they had to see how much data got exfiltrated. And then lo and behold, after CrowdStrike restores their system, Biden gives a state of the state address or whatever. So there's there's that angle of it, which obviously is satire. Hopefully, and people don't actually believe that. I believe it. I just told you I believe everything. Come on, man. So, well, and, and that's the other thing that's been thrown out there as well. You know, we, we can walk down this. Why, why was this even called a cyber incident? Why was this not just a, an IT issue? Is it only because it was an AV software that it was yeah. a security software? If this was, say, HRIS HR, yeah, or any other type of application that was not security related, would it have just been called an IT outage or an IT incident or things like that? This was a normal change, which is also one more reason it was pushed out to everybody instead of it being staggered, things like that. Why do we still have these saying, was this a security incident? Operations in most organizations owns updates. They own patching. They, they own that process, not security. So, Everything here looks to me to be an operational issue. So why is there even a conversation of if this is a cyber incident or an IT? I'd agree with you. This is an IT incident. And that's why a lot of, like, I think a lot of companies, even CrowdStrike, they, they, didn't, they did not post a security bulletin. They just posted, this is what's going on. We had an outage. Sorry. Yep. Did you? Was anyone here actually impacted? at all by this i was i was getting ready to go to the pool so no <laughs> <laughs> i was not doing any windows based work that had the crowdstrike agent on it so nothing it for you. Or, do, or do you mean downstream do you mean downstream effects Just i think in... lens flight got delayed yeah but he was flying southwest and apparently they were running windows 3.1 so they were no okay. that's a lie yeah yeah it is yeah that, that's been get... debunked yeah, yeah. <laughs> They're they're not a CrowdStrike shop. That's the only thing that saved them is they're not a CrowdStrike shop. Maybe they're or none of the critical on systems on Windows. Yeah, we'll yep, never yep. know. They're they're doing good things. So, how are you impacting it, Ben? No, I flew back on Thursday, so I flew back the day before. So I was very fortunate that even though I'm on a plane most weeks of of the year, I was fortunate that I flew back the day before everything started. It being impacted so i i was very fortunate there i took a picture of a couple of the screens at the uh, airport where they were blue screens and a uh, recovery mode so it was fun yeah i came back a few days after you and i even i i sent it to you guys I, a picture of me sitting in front of a airport sign that was still in the, the recovery boot mode like 
That's the only thing I noticed is I had uh, upgraded a, a flight and it's insane. Like, so if you have a, a seat that was like bottom of the barrel, but it was moved up just a little bit, and then you upgrade from there, they they credit you back the twenty six dollars, and then you just pay like the fair difference. It's kind of weird, but normally that when I make that change, it comes in within seconds of doing the upgrade. It, this one came in this morning. And that was like, that was last week. <laughs> so it was a the back end, end but it didn't, it didn't impact up. me negatively at all. Yeah. I was telling my wife, I said, should, should I go to the kiosk and just like fix it for them or, uh, or leave it alone? <laughs> if you were nice, you would have fixed it. Again, yeah. it needs physical presence. You know? Yeah. Bust out the laptop, you know, connect to it and, and get at it. I was driving through San Diego at, in like these bus shelters in San Diego. And there's no paper ads anymore. Everything's digital now. It's just these digital billboards inside these bus shelters. We're all just showing the recovery screen. Like they're just down until somebody physically goes to that bus shelter and reboots it so go ahead and fix it and then send them an invoice for your you know whatever your <laughs> hourly rate is and say hey here i am you're welcome i just feel terrible for any frontline worker that is you know at minimum wage or slightly above because you know they just got irate people just screaming yes. at them and they, they have literally nothing they can do about it yeah like even the starbucks app the coffee bean app you couldn't order ahead like just everything was down. You had to physically go into the store, and hopefully, when you're in the store, the actual register key or kiosk would work, and you could actually buy a coffee. But, I mean, they're crediting this to be the worst IT outage in history: 8.5 million endpoints. And, and to some extent, I think that's true. I think we we probably haven't had this many canceled flights since 9/11. But one of the things that stood out to me was for state and local governments, they were hit. And, you know, they're known not to have you know, real, really sophisticated IT staff. And there are exceptions, of course. But um, even like 911 call centers went down. And I remember the very worst cyber attacks against you know, Baltimore, Atlanta. They always said 911 is not affected. This one actually affected the 911 call centers. So what do you think? Do you think people are going to go 50-50? Like they'll Sentinel-1 and CrowdStrike 50-50 here. This they one's still two go agents. All in. Yeah, just for <laughs> Double down. <laughs> Toy, to, to, twice as much attack surface, twice as much exposure. <laughs> well, or you, you go the other way and say, this is exactly why you don't run security, because it can crash your machine. Yeah. Or, like I said, just 50-50 in the environment, right? Instead of all eggs in one basket on all your devices, you go 50-50. Uh, that's 50 that's on an that operation. Like, I want to get yeah. Ben's take on that. What would it take as a CISO to run 50% CrowdStrike, 50% Sentinel-1? Like, that just seems or like an Defender operational or whatever, nightmare. Right? So, yeah. No, well, that's the thing. On what? You know, if 50, you end with on your workstations, or yeah. do you run a different one on your servers versus your workstations? And I've all, almost every organization I've been in, we run a different AV on the servers versus the workstations. So you, we always want to have some, you know, already doing some it. differentiation. So, and that's not all that uncommon in the field to to have that. But I don't know that you're going to sit there and say, you know, half of your in use devices are going to be on a different AV client other than if there's an operational, well, for some reason you still have antiquated software. So we're still running Windows 2003 server. Well, you can't run say CrowdStrike on that. So you're going to have to get something that will run on that. So maybe you get some version of ESET that'll still license that for you and you run that on those devices. But I don't think you're going to get anywhere near a 50-50 on the same type of workstations because you know, from a operational, from total cost of ownership, from all of those things, the you know, it's going to be very high cost operating like that. Now you have to have your people trained, your support desk are going to have to be trained on that. And is it at the end of the day, truly lowering, managing and mitigating any risk? And can you sell that to really to anybody else in the business of this has to happen because this once in a hundred year type of thing or once every 15 years type of thing will minimize. Well, is half the company being down versus the, yeah. so you just got to, yeah, again, take, how do you manage your risk? How do you minimize it? And what's that going to look like? 
I have the, black, really? the so-called black swan events. They seem to be happening like once every 15 days now. <laughs> so, like, <laughs> every yes. other week, there's something new that's like unprecedented or once in a generation, like Azure I, went down. <laughs> I don't think we were as connected as we are now than we were 15, 20, 30 years ago, right? I mean, Agreed. back then, we were, we're talking, you know, 386, 486, Pentium processing, right? So Pentium. Hit the turbo uh, button, Glenn. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just like you said, 15 years ago, we had print banners, billboards inside bus shelters. Now everything's digital. Same with menus. We yes. Physically printed yeah. menus. Now everything's digital. Like you can't order from KFC because the the screen showing the menu blue screened. All right. Today I learned Crystal eats KFC. You think you know better. <laughs> he still eats Taco Bell too, like crazy. <laughs> Taco oh, Bell, that Diablo sauce. How do you think do you... I never caught COVID, Brian? Oh, I have. Yeah. I have a conspiracy theory. I think that Chipotle was hit really, really hard by this. I think they may have been the actual target for whatever reason. Because when I went there yesterday to get my burrito bowl, I was like, hey, dude, see this guy all the time. He's kind of a jerk. I was like, hey, uh, you know, <laughs> double steak, hook it up. And he you know, gives me the scoop number one. And scoop number two, he puts it on, but he leaves one piece of steak on the spoon and puts it back. Oh God! He like he literally was, robbery, like, Brian. It yeah. was. I was like, I just looked at. It, I was like, dude, what is that? I was like, this is one piece. I was like, that warrants like a whole other scoop. <laughs> so, <laughs> the customer is always right. I, I heard though at, at Chipotle, if you give them like the nod, the side look, the, the yeah. side look, is that is that is that true, Brian? No, th- did, did this he... guy doesn't work. He I, he just doesn't like me. I think I, I may have wore <laughs> something that. Didn't align with his him. beliefs. <laughs> that, yeah, like I see him. Really? He's Brian like a wearing jerk. something offensive. Yeah, no way. Yeah, like like an American flag, right? And the guy was this weird. <laughs> right. um, and like Brian and like, said, "Holy guacamole!" And it it, it insulted <laughs> him. So I did yeah. use my free birthday guacamole though, and I enjoyed it. So in your yeah, face, yeah. happy birthday, Brian! Didn't give you yeah. your birthday shout out at the top. Oh, of the show. sweet sixteen. Yeah, to be dumb again. The other thing I, I the, the last note I have here was the number of ambulance chasers. I I, I saw one <laughs> like you know like I said I was on vacation I was trying to stay disconnected but I saw one screenshot floating around of the I don't know he was head of sales or something for cyber reason, and he said hey are you tired of your EDR crashing your sub call one eight and then he gave the toll free number but the toll free number ended with no N O C R W D no crowd like uh, they, apparently they had enough time to register this vanity phone number and set up this hotline for people that want to switch off CrowdStrike on the cyber region. Wasn't what wasn't he the same guy that is just like I was sitting at dinner and my mom asked me, uh, could this ever happen in my company? You know, I'm like, absolutely not, it can't. You know what I'm talking about? Did you see that one? I didn't see that. Like I said, I tried to stay disconnected, but this oh one gosh. was making its rounds. Insane in the membrane. I yeah, and, and that's the thing is, you know, why are you doing so things like this? And you work in software, you work in software sales, and we live in a very connected world. So you start doing things like this, you're gonna have a reputation, and that's gonna stick with you for a long, long time. So no, it's just not being a good person. Brian has a reputation, just definitely at Chipotle, so. (laughs) (laughs) Sorry, they withhold that one piece of steak for you. That's right. It's so weird, (laughs) man. And then then I I was like- aggressive way at getting back at you. That'll show them. And then I asked for the queso, and he he's like, he literally put it only on one side of the bowl, and I had to like stir it. <laughs> a little passive aggressive. I mean, what long has this guy? How long has this been going on? Is this guy still working there? What the heck? He's, like, yeah, he's I I'm, I believe he's a manager. And what's what kind of really kind of pisses me off is that I I actually address him by his name because I know who he is. And anytime I go there, I always like, and I typically pay cash when I go to Chipotle. I always leave like like. Let's say, you know, my thing is like 13 bucks, right? I got seven and change or six and change. And then I always give them the whole thing. I was like, put it right there in the tip for all you guys. Like I'm, wow. I'm known as a big tipper uh, for them. Cause all around a good lo- guy. Well, there's a lot of cool people there. Him, not one of them though, for sure. For some reason <laughs> he's just, yeah, I'll kill Maybe him with kindness. Big, big tipper like that. Like they should know you. They should greet you when you come in. They should know your orders. Like you the usual Mr. Deach. Dude, at uh, Jersey Mike's, they do a sandwich in a bowl, and same exact thing. Like, I walk in, hey, Brian, how's it going? Like, the, And I've only been there three times, but I always throw money in the tip jar just to be nice. Yeah. 
they hook it up over there, man. That that's a good sandwich bowl. I'll tell you what, make me make me want to go to Chipotle later on. I, so. I, I, all I'm saying is, we do know people at Chipotle. We know their CISO. If it continues, we can make some calls for you, Brian, we'll, and we'll we can see what this. we can do for you. <laughs> you know what? I'll, we'll handle it externally. I'm gonna win them over one way or the other. <laughs> Maybe you can wear a rainbow last... shirt next time you go in there and make him win him over that way. Hey, you know what, though? <laughs> Chipotle like, takes care of their people. Like I don't know if you guys have seen it. At least in Arizona, this would be a, kind of a lot of money. But it's just like there's a career path, like guaranteed three years. It gets you to 100K. Like, that's not a bad deal for, for some younger people that are out there. I Stick think with it's... it in an industry that traditionally has very high turnover. And very high yeah. turnover costs a lot of money. In and out, in and out was advertising. If you become a manager of the store, it's 175k. I'm sorry, what? 175k to manage in the, the wrong store. business. Yeah, and free in and out. What's not to yeah. love? Yeah. <laughs> and they didn't the even know what's on that on the hidden menu too. Ah. All right, last piece I want to mention on this since we are running up on time here, the. I think the even insult to injury, because Microsoft made like a bootable USB. You just plug this thing in, boots into safe mode, deletes the file, like set it and forget it. The problem is BitLocker. You have to manually enter the BitLocker key for every BitLocker lock machine, which is basically every enterprise machine should be BitLocker encrypted. And since safe mode is not a bypass to BitLocker, you have to boot into safe mode, you have to boot in the key, decrypt the hard drive, and only then could you delete the problematic file. So you have these people punching in physical keyboards the 48 bit bit locker key for every single machine and hopefully you saved it somewhere and it's in a vault and you had to just manually type this thing in try to figure out what's an o what's a zero try to figure out you know the, the different the things. eyes 48 the l's bits. yes the ones uh oh, gosh if you're an it person working 24 hours straight like, and your eyes start to cross it's yeah that, not, that was not, not a they were, they were not happy about this, for sure. You're not paying me enough to do this. Oh, my God. <laughs> One I'm going to go, work at, Ch- gonna go work at Chipotle. <laughs> Chipotle. One company got clever. They, they converted the BitLocker keys into barcodes, and they started using a barcode scanner to enter all the keys. In. Like what? That's like I, necessity being the mother of all innovation. But, so but, we, but how would that even work? Uh, yeah. You know, because you're, you're, most of this is CLI at that point. So what's you know how's that scanner working? How's it integrated? The OS isn't even booted that, you know, to that level that it could take that, right? I'll send you the screenshot. I think in safe mode, they'll, it can still load a USB keyboard driver. I guess a barcode scanner is the equivalent of a keyboard, and you just scan the code, and then that's that code that that barcode is the equivalent of the BitLocker key. Oh, Thirty thousand, so pretty clever. But it's all different, like barcodes it's not the same one it's not like you're buying produce right <laughs> got... yeah exactly so you, yeah. you type in the host name of the machine look it up in your your key vault convert it to a barcode then scan it this faster than manually typing in 48 bits on every single yep. machine again pain <laughs> <laughs> well, we continue to get great comments about our dad joke of the week dad joke of the week this week our guest ben is up I, you mean I had to actually come up with a dad joke of the week? Yes, Benifer, oh, get it together. Guest. Oh, come on, man. You, you could have at least given me a heads up. <laughs> All right. Did you hear about the cleaners who went to space? No. Neither did no. I. They ended up scrubbing the mission. <laughs> ah, wah, wah, wah. You know, <laughs> the best dad joke yet. Yes. Yeah, you, you put me on the spot. That's the best I could come up with. All right. To wrap things up, use updated iPhones if you value your privacy. And be very wary of security updates. That's all I have for this week. We hope you enjoyed this week's episode. Find us all on LinkedIn. Links will be in the description. Follow us on Instagram at Pepdac Podcast. Thank you to all our listeners and subscribers. Raise five stars the iTunes store on Spotify and left us a review. We appreciate you all spreading the word to help grow the show. The best way to find us is to search for the Pepcat Podcast on your favorite podcast listening app. For my co-host Brian Deach and Glenn McGinnis and our guest Ben Coral, I'm Chris Lee. Thanks for listening. We'll see you all next weekend. As always, have a nice day. Bye, Felicia. The walk is Coral. Have a nice day. <laughs>